Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to a brand new episode of the Word of the Day podcast, coming to you, as always, pre-recorded from the RAV4 Studios. My name is Jamie Silva, I am your host, and I'm ready to hop right into it with today's word, which is the noun rhubarb. Now, any foodies listening might recognize this as an obscure, bitter-tasting vegetable that looks kind of like chard, though I always thought rhubarb was some sort of fruit, because I was always seeing references to rhubarb pies. But apparently, it's a vegetable. I don't know why people are putting green leafy vegetables in pies, but then again, I probably would have said the same thing about spinach and smoothies, which is pretty mainstream nowadays, so who am I to pass judgment on rhubarb desserts? Anyway, this is not the sort of rhubarb we are talking about today. The meaning I have in mind is a dispute or controversy, probably a very contentious one. So if you and a colleague get into a heated argument over whether or not it is okay to heat up some fresh clams in the microwave, and your loud and angry remarks can be heard well beyond the break room, that would count as a rhubarb, whereas a friendly and polite exchange of views about those same clams would not qualify as a rhubarb. Here's another way to think about it. If you've ever heard clips of the British Parliament in session, and all the muttering and murmuring and shouting and general hubbub that seemingly accompany any discussion of issues affecting the British citizenry, then you know exactly what a rhubarb sounds like. And if this isn't familiar to you, here's a clip. I didn't receive a proper answer then. Maybe Dodgy Dave will answer it now. And by the way... Order, order, I, order, order. I must ask the honourable gentleman, order. Order, indeed. Okay, let's now take a look at the online definition for rhubarb, which goes like this, quote, the noise made by a group of actors to give the impression of indistinct background conversation, or to represent the noise of a crowd, especially by the random repetition of the word rhubarb with different intonations, unquote. Wow, okay, that is very different from what I expected. A neat trivia, though. I guess next time you're watching a movie, uh, keep an ear out for people saying rhubarb over and over in any large crowd scene or a crowded restaurant scene. Though, of course, if they're doing it right, you won't be able to make out the individual words because it'll just sound like indistinct background crowd slash conversation noise. And actually, as long as we're on the subject of audience noises made by paid actors, this is a fantastic time to tell you about the concept of clacks, which I've always found fascinating and pretty funny. This is going to be kind of a long tangent from rhubarb. Uh, I mean, it's somewhat related, but not very. Uh, but trust me, it's, it's worth it. So, the word claque, spelled C-L-A-Q-U-E, comes from the French word claque, one meaning of which is to clap, as in applause. In English, the word claque has two related meanings. First, quote, a group of sycophantic followers, unquote. And sycophantic means like a sycophant, which is to say a mindless flatterer or follower or hanger-on. And the second meaning of clack is, quote, a group of people hired to applaud or heckle a performer or public speaker, unquote. Now, when I heard about this clacking business, I wondered, like, did this actually happen? Did theaters and music halls used to be filled with undercover clack A's, paid by the actors or theater companies or whoever to be faux audience members? Well, as it turns out, this happened a lot, and it happened in spades. Back in the 16th century, you see, an enterprising French poet had the idea of buying a few tickets to his own plays, and then handing them out to friends for free, on the condition that they applaud his performance. And look, what's the harm in that? I mean, if someone gives you a ticket to their show, and you show up but don't cheer, what's up with that? It seems downright rude. But things took a turn for the corporate in 1820s Paris, when whole claque companies started up. These offered as many individual claques as you might need, in exchange for a fee, of course. I don't know if buyers could pay per bravo or had the option of splurging on the deluxe two-encore package, but if those options were available, that would just be good business. Now, you may have noticed that the definition of clack said that these folks could be paid to heckle as well as applaud, and that isn't the half of it. There was actually a whole catalog of audience reactions you could hire them for. Laughers, for example, would laugh extra hard at the jokes, criers would start to cry at the proper times, so-called officers or commissioners would learn the play by heart and enlighten their audience members between acts about how brilliant it was, and lastly, a group simply known as encorers would call for encores at the end of the program. Overseeing everything would be the chef de claque, aka the leader of the whole claque, who would orchestrate all this stuff telling people when to cry or laugh or clap, but subtly, because of course, if normal audience members knew what was going on, the effect would probably be ruined. When you put it all together, you might have had nearly as much acting going on in the audience as there was on the stage. 
Amazingly, all this is not just a relic of history. These clacks are still doing their thing in many places even today. Take, for example, this mildly edited selection from a 2013 New York Times article about a clack that operates in the world-famous Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Quote, Mr. Abramov, that's the chef de claque, Mr. Abramov's people are ordinary-looking, middle-aged Russian women in cloth coats, and their expressions are all business. They assemble on the stairs, and as the first curtain approaches, they break into formations like synchronized swimmers and vanish into the stream of people heading to their seats, where they spread out amongst constellations of stools and chairs that did not exist on the official seating chart. Executed properly, what he and his team do is a kind of science. The applause of a few imperceptible well-placed actors who are alert to acoustics, mass psychology, and the technical challenges that face a performer on stage can switch on an audience, much as a pilot light ignites a gas oven, prompting neophytes to recognize that they are witnessing something remarkable. And Jamie here, uh, neophyte, as we explained in episode 51, means like a, a noob or someone who's just been introduced to something. Continuing. The audience does not trust itself. It trusts someone else, says the ballet critic Vadim Gayevsky. If it hears someone applauding very aggressively and intensively, they think that something extraordinary is going on, which they did not grasp, and they generally feel that they should not look like fools, that they should join in too, so that nobody sees that they missed it. Unquote. Once again, this is just fantastic, but I think it's time we get back to today's word, rhubarb, which, as we recall, can refer to the noise of a crowd, especially when manufactured by the random repetition of the word rhubarb with different intonations. But once again, this is not the sense of rhubarb that we planned to feature today. I was thinking of like a heated argument or dispute, and while an online definition of this sense was a little harder to find because the other meanings are more common, I did find one, and here it is. Quote, a heated dispute or controversy, unquote. Exactly as I suspected, this sense of rhubarb apparently had its origins in 1930s and 40s baseball slang, when announcers started using it to refer to some sort of commotion or controversy on the field. Picture, for example, the shouted epithets and vaguely genteel pushing and shoving that often ensue after a pitcher hits a batter and or the batter charges the mound. That sort of scrum and the general uproar that goes along with it is about as perfect a depiction of rhubarb as I know, right up there with that British Parliament scene. And even now, baseball broadcasts are one of the most common settings where you might hear rhubarb used in this sense. One can imagine how they started using rhubarb this way, watching a mass of confusion and motion from the broadcast booth and listening to the audible but indistinct yelling emanating therefrom might have reminded those announcers with theater backgrounds of this practice of having a bunch of people say rhubarb over and over again in order to imitate a crowd. This, to be clear, is sort of speculation on my part, but it does sound plausible and it might help you remember the meaning. So there you have it. That is a rhubarb. Thus, if you and some other people are standing around talking angrily at each other, maybe pointing some fingers and rolling some eyes as well, you could take the high road and say, look, I don't want this to turn into a huge rhubarb and people are starting to stare, so how about we just agree to disagree on whether Shaquille O'Neal should start his own burger place called Shake Shack. Shack, of course, spelt with a Q. Keep in mind also that people who say rhubarb are usually calm and collected sorts, who are expressing their hope that others will be as placid and even-keeled as they are, either by not participating in rhubarbs or by trying to quell them should any arise. Alright, it's now time to get some examples of how to use rhubarb in ordinary conversation or writing. Example number one. When her co-workers discovered that Kathy had taken all the money they had chipped in for donuts, then bought the cheapest variety and pocketed the extra cash, a real rhubarb commenced. Example number two. The weekly roommate meeting was devolving into a rhubarb of the worst sort when the pizza arrived. Extra breadsticks with garlic butter dipping sauce soon calmed the mood and diverted everyone's attention from the meeting's original agenda, which was addressing the growing ant infestation. The ants themselves, as it turned out, would later also be excited about the extra breadsticks. Okay, folks, that is it for the examples, and seeing as how we've got nothing else to say about rhubarbs, clacks, or breadsticks, that is it for the show as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. This has been another edition of the Word of the Day podcast. I'm Jamie Silva saying so long from the Rav4 Studios. We'll see you next time.